Okay, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday here in the mobile studio. Live from Willie's Tropical Tattoo. We're sitting outside of the tattoo parlor watching the trucks and trailers start to head north. Daytona is over. We got a little recap for you tonight. Don't go anywhere. We're just a couple minutes away from going live with Shop Talk. Brian Woodford in the house. Good to see you. Hey, y'all, that sounds like Rebecca. Bruno Capoli in the house. Kathy Shepard, Rita Klein. Parker Love, good to see all you guys, man. Hey, we're coming to you live from the mobile studio, the van that we haven't been in months and months and months. We're working out a couple of the kinks here, but we got a great show for you tonight. Killer, killer guest, someone whose work I just can't even imagine. I can't, I, I, he's like, it's unreal. It's unreal. Human beings do not do art like this. Stick around, it's going to be a great show. Folks, even shot the brand new bike. If you didn't get a chance to see that, head over to Cyclosaurus Instagram page. We got a couple sh- choice shots up from now. Steve Burrell's back in the D. Poppy, we miss you already. Steve Burrell stepped up big time to be our cameraman at Willie's. Worked his ass off. What's up from North Idaho? Bill Needham. Damn, I bet you it's still cold up there. The mountains of Idaho get cold even when it's warm on the valley floor. Going live in just one minute. Stick around. Okay, Heather, with 59 seconds left. We set this thing up so fast tonight, we don't even have our sound effects, so you gotta do the whistle. <laughs> All right, man, let's get ready and go live with Shop Talk. Here we go. Scooter, tramps, and chopper jockeys all across the land. It's Sunday night, reasonably close to 9. We're a little bit late, but hey, we're still in Daytona. Daytona was off of the ever-loving hook this year. Probably 10, maybe 15 years since I remember Daytona being this busy, this well-attended. And it's proof that people are ready to get out, get on motorcycles, hit the road, see each other again. And man, we're, we're, we were just glad to be here at every point of it. Every show that we were part of, every time that, that we hooked up with people and, and saw people that we were with out their company for a year, 
it was fantastic. So thanks to everybody that made this this bike week such a success. Heather's in the house. We're we're actually in the mobile studio. Howdy, howdy. How do you feel about that? I am happy. I am happy because that means I am still in Florida. I am getting reports of snow at home, and I don't care if we ever go back, <laughs> except to get our dogs. Oh, that was the bad thing. We I left. Know. We left the puppies at home. But it's snowing there. It's not here. Mm. It was 86 and gloriously sunny, <laughs> and I am not complaining. What was your f favorite part of Daytona? Quick. Oh my gosh, my favorite. All the bike shows. Because each one, just when you th thought another amazing bike couldn't roll in, there was another one and another one and another one. And seeing what everybody did with their time in 2020 yeah, was mind-blowing. That, uh, that was the thing that was really apparent was right off the bat you could see what people did with their COVID time. You know, and I, just like me, there wasn't, a whole lot of, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of gym activity, but there sure was garage activity. Everybody... Everybody spent their time in the garage, and you could tell because front to back, it was just custom motorcycles everywhere, brand new stuff, you know, that had had never been on the scene before. When you do these shows a lot, you'll see some stuff that are repeats year after year, and man, tonight it was ridiculous. Oh, it was, it was or this unbelievable. Year, I mean. Yeah, it I'm was reading. unbelievable. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh. We're trying to get our groove back. We're in the mobile studio. We're parked in Willie's Tropical Tattoo parking lot. Um... And like I said, it just, it was a phenomenal bike week. It was very reminiscent of years past. Um, and just seeing everybody again, because it has been a full year. Like actually today, today yeah. marks one year since the, shit the hit world the fan. went you can say shit it. crazy. The shit hit the fan. Uh, hey, I have to give a shout out real quick because normally, you know, in the studio, I'm sitting right there with my lifelong brother and my partner in, in uh, Flat Broke Chops and Rods, Mark Persichetti. And he was unable to join us tonight through some technical difficulties that I'm still dealing with in the van. He's on the chat, and he's going to be harassing all you guys from there. So big love, Mark, and we'll have him back on here by next week. Right on. So Willie's. Let's talk about Shut Willie's for a second. Me. Greatest chopper show on earth. Like, hands down. And, again, it was one of the best shows that they had in a long time. They shut registration down. Never happened before. I don't I don't ever remember them shutting registration. At really. 167 motorcycles. Ridiculous. And so glad I didn't have to judge. I'm glad I didn't have to judge any shows this week because <laughs> they were, just, like we said earlier, I hate to sound like a broken record. There were so many killer bikes, although I'm going to throw this one out there. If you guys don't follow Mad Fab on Instagram, Brock Bridges. We were fortunate enough to have one of his bikes on the cover of this issue that we just printed, but he brought two new bikes this year. Unbelievable. Young kid just coming out into into the motorcycle scene and he's coming out swinging. Yeah, and listen, when we say when we say that what he brought to the table was an incredible motorcycle, he started with an iron head, 180 degrees on the heads. He divorced the, the, or not divorced, separated, was separated and divorced. So he separated the rocker boxes and then divorced the transmission all in, all in the same motorcycle and put that, all that shit back together in a way that was mind blowing. Flawlessly. Yep. And I think one of the best things about him is he's <coughs> ridiculously humble. Just, he's just like, yeah, he does it because he loves it. Not because he's looking to to get rich quick off of it and you know he does this he does what he wants how he wants it strictly for himself and then when people dig it he's, he's blown just, away he's blown yeah. away right on so hey man listen this is shop talk if it's the first time you're tuning in it's a little program we do every sunday 9 p.m eastern time um some news some entertainment we usually have a guest or two and um we start the whole thing off a little program we like to call the news First up in the news tonight, and this coming in from the Daytona Beach News Journal. Calculated, Brandon Pass uses late pass to win historic Daytona 200. Um, yes, there are race. There's racing in Daytona. That's that's what it's all about. You know, if you if the only thing you did was race to the Iron Horse, you probably still had a pretty good time. But 
after being your after year being canceled due to COVID, the 79th Daytona 200 returned in dramatic fashion Sunday afternoon with Brandon Pash passing Sean Dillon Kelly as the two came to the checkers to win the historic race by just three hundredths of a second. Wow. And That's man, like a photo finish, right? right? Literally a, a photo finish. And those guys are hauling the mail. You know, I mean, like if you you take take some time and go up there and watch those races, it's it's killer. Mm. 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 So, this is sad and almost goes down as as batshit crazy news, but it is our very sad obligation to have to report the news that the naked cowboy went to jail while he was in Bike Week. <laughs> They let him out, though. He's out. He's out. They but let they, him out. Dude, they broke his guitar. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> you know, but like, he they arrested him for aggressive panhandling. He's a naked cowboy. How aggressive can you be, you know? Right? So, Robert Bruck, the Times Square naked cowboy, was sprung from a Florida jail and received a warm welcome at the Bike Week Festival in Daytona. He's out, he's out, a motorcyclist shouted. Other bikers honked horns and offered thumbs up as Bruck strolled along the sidewalk wearing his trademark white briefs. Or as mm -hmm. we like to call them, tidy, tidy whities. Tidy whities, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, man. Let's uh, let's take a break, break from the news because that's a little too much to begin with. Oh. Um, Great guest tonight, huh? You've been waiting for this one for a long time. I know I how well, you're a super big fan of this cat. Like, I, it's almost embarrassing how much I like his work because every time I see it, I'm just completely and utterly blown away. And you said it earlier, no human should have this much talent. Like, yeah. it's... So almost obviously, words can't describe it. Obviously, we're talking about Steve Gibson from Air, Oil, and Lead, and... The thing that strikes me about this guy's work is, you know, in, in today's world where everything is so digital and so, you know, so produced, when you first look at his art until you really see pictures, and I have to admit this straight up, like I'm totally going to admit this, it's like, okay, but, you know, is he really doing that? And then you watch, you, you see the pictures of him actually putting his hands on this stuff, and it's like, that is just, it's so not fair. He's so good. He's so good. You literally feel like you could walk right inside of his work, you know, totally three dimensional. It's, yeah. If you didn't know, if you weren't fortunate enough to see him create it, it's a photograph. You would think one would think it's that good. Um, and he was actually awarded Cycle Source Magazine's 2020 Artist of the Year. And justifiably so. Absolutely. Hands down. Well, let's get him on the show and see if we can get some talk. Steve, how you doing, man? I'm good. Am I here? Yes, you are. Am I good? Very cool. So are you tired of us fanboying over I'm, you yet? <laughs> dude, I'm like embarrassed by it a little bit. Oh. <laughs> but a little bit. Listen, seriously, like like I said, you know, I hate to even admit that I'm I'm an artist in the face of talent like yours because it's it's so, so good and it's like really a whole other level. But from an artist's perspective, Man, you know, everybody strives to get depth in their art. And you literally, in your pieces, you look like you can reach right into them. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, like, it's 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 certainly all technique. I, I keep telling people, like, the way I airbrush is kind of, like, it's all oil painting techniques. All the stuff that I've been kind of, you know, from a technical standpoint, I, I virtually take a lot of the rules of oil painting and I repurpose them through an airbrush I, I i feel like that's why like i get the depth that i can get out of it um and that was kind of my background years and years ago like you know most most of my friends kind of went the like the fine art kind of gallery direction and i'm going back into like the mid to late 90s into the early 2000s um and i put the airbrush down for a long time and you know in favor of a paintbrush and traditional like a uh, you know oil painting and um murals and whatnot it was when atlantic city was kind of in its heyday too yeah. so there was a lot of mural work in the area um so i was around a lot of guys who had a lot of a lot of talent and that were were very giving of their time um and it was definitely an era where it was like a shut up and listen kind of time too so you, you sat around a lot of old old sign painters um 
that really just knew their craft and knew their shit. And you just, you watched and you learned and, and it's the best way to do it. And I, I kind of took all that knowledge and eventually transitioned it through an airbrush. So I feel like I'm playing with a different, a different set of tools sometimes compared to what I think a lot of people do with an airbrush. Um, because like the people that I was hanging with, like I'm, I'm no, I'm a, a far cry from the talent that in the room that I try to stay in at times. I mean, some of the guys that, that I, you know, I fanboy over, like I can't hold a candle to. And I, I kind of think that's the way you should be. You I'm know? sorry. I find that hard to believe. I, oh, I, I really do just because, and again, I'm sorry if I embarrass you, but it lit every piece you do just one after the other is flawless. And it's just, you look like you, like I'm looking right now, I'm on your website, you know, the skull, I look, it just looks like I could reach in and up. pick that skull up and <clears throat> hold it in my hands. Or your self portrait, it looks like a photograph. Every there, single oh, one. Funny. There's the skull that she's talking about. And man, like, Which seriously. Which one is that the one that, I think Lisa, Lisa Ballard, I think Chop Cult just posted a, a skull. Maybe that was the one. I don't know. No. Yeah, that one right there. Was there a point? Yeah, that was a fun one. Was there a point in your life where you're like, this is what I want to do. This is what I was meant to do. And I don't want to do anything else. Uh, that was all. I definitely think that was a like a birthright. I was one of those people right out of the gate that, you know, whether it be building stuff with Legos or drawing or whatever, I was without, you know, without a doubt, right out of the gate, like drawing and in that direction. And I was definitely fortunate enough to have parents and step parents who really nurtured that and pointed me in a direction because they could see what that meant to me. Yeah, that's um, great. It was. It, 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 there's there's a lot to be said for that because I've heard I've heard just the opposite from people too over the years you know trying to make a living at it be became a completely different conversation that, that that's for sure but um uh no it was it was very cool they let me they let me fall in love with the thing that i felt like i was you know meant to do and really i feel like the hard part for most artists is just trying to find out where you fit in um and i feel like a lot of times the, this you know um this industry kind of found me as much as i found it um and i feel like a lot of that is is you know following your gut regardless of what it tells you to do because you know when you're younger i think everybody paints a picture of what what their life could be or what it should be and then there's the reality which is what it becomes yeah. so in 20 20 years ago i wouldn't have found myself kind of where i'm at right now um but i'm super stoked i'm kind of where i am like because just the, the the amount of talent like you were uh, who were you just talking about? The the one builder, the young kid that you guys were just oh, Brock Bridges. Bridges. Yeah. Brock, just when you hear that kind of stuff and you realize that there's just so much talent out there, you know, like I get like so enthralled with people who are so good at their craft. And then I think that the beauty of what I do is, is like I can get together with some of these people and marry what I'm good at with what they're really good at. And you wind up with such a unique, you know, I don't look at a motorcycle or a bike as it's a piece of art form to me that has form and function. And when you have people that are that stoked about what they're doing as, you know, on, on level with as stoked as you are with what you're doing and you get to marry all of that together in idea and form, like there's no other art form that I can think of worldwide ever in the history of art that, that marries so many different craftsmen together for for one you know one ideal or one one exceptional piece of artwork um it's it, it's it's phenomenal to me it continues to be phenomenal to me and that's you know i continue to be jazzed by the people that that surround this culture and the more i learn about it the more i get stoked you know even more like you know inspirations around every corner it's it's mind-blowing to me at times well, one of the one of the things I really dig, and again, this is you know from my own perspective of of art, is the fact that you're in this you're in this industry, you're in you're part of this community. You pull inspiration from the people and the sites and everything around it, but you also and I'm I'm gonna bring this this photo this helmet up, and I'm I'm not sure I'm almost I'm almost embarrassed and I'm not sure where where the image comes from, but. It really looks like a, almost like a traditional Norman Rockwell kind of painting. Oh, probably. Let me see which one it is. Hold on. <clears throat> is, the, is it the welder? Yeah, yeah. That's, um, it's a portion of, um, let me see if I can remember it. 
uh, blacksmith, uh, I think it was called the blacksmith shop, and I believe it was a painting from the late 1940s. Um, uh, who was it? Taylor Schultz reached out to me. I guess it was back in 2015. I think it was the Lost Highway show uh -huh. down in Southern California. He had put together, um, I guess Simpson had sponsored a, a helmet art art show for charity. Um, and it was he was probably he was probably one of the first people to reach out to me for for something. Um, and I was jazzed on it. He said, you can do whatever you want. So, you know, I always like whenever there's a charity kind of thing, it's I always look at them as opportunities for me to fanboy over things. And I'm very much um, I guess you could say a student of art history and Norman Rockwell to me just screams Americana Absolutely. the way I would say like David Yule does um, in this community. Um, but, you know, like I, I always like the challenges of, you know, how do you take a square image and wrap it around, uh, you know, kind of a 360 yeah. degree image. So I kind of had to chop up the painting a bit to make it work and flow. But like, you know, you're working in 3D, um, something that's not meant to be portrayed in 3D. Uh, but, yeah, the rest of that image that you're showing, you know, there's a blacksmith in the middle of it um, on the other side. You know, the image itself were, were two blacksmiths, I think, in competition and people, you know, waging a bet on whatever they were they were trying to fabricate um but yeah it was a norman rockwell i airbrushed it just kind of figured it out but you you know that posed the challenge of how to you know get that image in a in a circle or you know in a spherical shape and then you know i i took a soccer ball and i, I broke up i guess what are they pentagons mm -hmm. or hexagons but that's how i gridded the image accurately to wrap it around an image you know it just I, I i get bored easy so i need to make more problems for myself to kind of figure my way out um but i think that kind of keeps you know keeps everything fresh to me too so um well but I, yeah I you just know have like mad a, respect because you know you see so many people get into a, a rut of you know as as they start to climb up through the ranks and in motorcycle culture art you see them start doing stuff that you know this is what people will expect you know this is this is what i should be doing for this culture and man to see you do some of the stuff that you do you go you know so far outside of the you know that same rut it's killer yeah i don't i feel like it's a strength and a weakness right there too i feel like i need to know more about where i am but i feel like my influences is are so far from like out in left field at times but, you know, I guess the question becomes, what do you do, you know, with the things that inspire you, you know, as it compares to where you actually are. So, you know, there's a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of fun there. I don't give it much thought. I just, I, you know, I feel like when you follow your heart and your intuition, you just, you, you got to roll with it. You know, I feel like if it's contrived or you're trying to be something you're not, you know, that, that certainly has a deadline on it. You know, there's definitely an end point there and it's just, you're not being true to yourself you know um so yeah there's there's never any shortage of inspiration for me i don't really feel like i'm gonna burn out anytime soon like i spent this whole covid time like in my cave like messing around with a lot more stuff and my process is is actually evolved a lot in the last year you know and hopefully in, in the next year so i can start sharing some of what i've been up to that's um, because I really hunkered down and burned the midnight oil and all I've been doing is like painting and That's mixing so colors and doing all sorts of shit that I'm not even, I'm not posting at all. I can't, um, I can't wait to see. You should like, and I say this in all honesty, it would be great for you to do your whole own show. Like you, yeah, I, whole I gallery. would, a whole gallery, yeah. like for, to be able to the, walk into a room just of your art. I just but I feel like what I'm good at is like painting other people's stuff though I feel like I really struggle for a sense of my own vision of things like that's what I look at like you know when I like David Yule's got to me such a, a defined idea of what he wants as an artist he's a he's a master practitioner of what he does in the traditional sense but I feel like there's a lot of people who are good technical artists and I put myself in a category that's kind of there. I'm, I'm technically sound, but I think I do lack the vision at times to kind of, you know, share with the world the way I experience it. And I feel like that's such a huge part of what it is to be an artist. And I feel like that's that's where I struggle a bit. Um, I'm going to come by with, that statement, honestly. I'm going to argue you with know, that. But, I'm going to argue with that. And I'm going to put up this picture. How? And this is... Okay. This is probably 
this is probably one of your most recognizable pieces for across the board because so many people are fans of of this brand and this shop so this is the the indian larry bike sitting in the middle of the shop and i have stood in that shop and looked at that bike like you're doing in this picture yeah and i think what i think what you capture in that picture is is that metaphysical connection that we have to this thing that you know like everything about the the grungy gray you know just like hard work blue collar everything about that shop yeah. and then this beautiful jewel in the centerpiece of it you know and and you do capture that you do that and, and more than that it's that moment in time and it, you know anybody that knows the backstory about that shop and and the the great people that are behind it it it's all captured in that photo you know i, I think you do that very well with some stuff yeah now i yeah i get it you know but i think you know, we're all victims of that. We're our worst critic too, a little bit, you know, like, um, I feel like when you are so into what you do, you know, and I think a lot of people would, you know, can, can relate to this statement. All, all you see is the mistakes. All you see is the marks you miss. You know, you're glad to share what you have done, but it's time to move on and you don't get the same joy out of it. Um, but I do feel like, like that piece in particular, you know, that, that, that is exactly, it resonates with me because it is, to me, it is blue collar. It is grungy. It is paint on me almost at all times. And that's my happy place. Wow. I'm, you know, that, that, that is my environment. And I guess maybe that's why that, that comes out that way. All right. Um, so we have some but, questions for you. First uh, of all, right on. that particular piece, oh. r roughly how many hours do you think you have into that? Dude, I don't know because I really started that when this whole COVID thing hit. So like and we were talking about before, I went straight into homeschooling three days a week. I had to like I actually moved um, where I was living into another place so that I could set up a shop like in a basement to accommodate schooling my kids and then working at night and then trying to get to the shop, um, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I don't, not as many as I, as you would think. I like, I tell people I probably spent the better part of a month on that piece, but like, I feel like if you were to like zoom in and really like look at the details, you'll see how much detail isn't there too. And I feel like that's where with, with my approach to painting that I try to walk that line mm -hmm. between, I don't want it to be totally photo realistic. Like I, want it, I want you to be able to. Yeah, it does. It's it's enough to know what your you know what the viewer's eyes are going to put together and the way right. that the the brain works. Um, you know, I use an example. I painted um, painted a picture of my my friend John years ago. He's a he's a model out in San Francisco, and he's wearing this stopwatch, or he's wearing you know, he's wearing um, an analog watch on his wrist. And I can remember people being like, "Ah, oh, it looks like a photograph. It looks like a photograph." And then I'll say, "Look, you know, go look at the watch that I painted." And there's only about eight or nine strokes in there. There's no dials. There's no numbers. But it, you know, it's I would say, you know, it, they're they're thoughtful art marks versus just like painting every single Dude, that's hair. That's such in a there. good phrase. That's such a you good know? phrase. Um, but I feel like that's why when you look at somebody like, uh, you know, Rembrandt, for example, like when I was waiting to be brought on, I was actually like studying this like Rembrandt painted eye from a painting and. Six, I think 1622 or something like that. But like when you when you really look at those marks and you look at the beginning of his career versus the end of his career, I mean, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're you know, we're communicating whether it's, you know, photorealism or, or the marks of a Jackson Pollock, you know, in its most primitive sense, art is, is the art of communication. You know, it, it precedes written and, you know, written language for that matter. So to me, you know, as an artist to efficiently communicate an idea, it's not how, not how to, it's, it's how best to do it. Not, you know, here's an eye, paint an eye, but how, you know, how do I see this eye in the most efficient way to describe it to somebody else? Yeah. Like, I don't need 50 strokes to say that. I need five well thought and placed strokes to say the exact same thing. Hmm. It's efficient. It's beautiful. You know, the colors and the transitions transition from one plane to the, to the next in a way that is more sophisticated and it's thought, I guess. And I feel like, the, the great artists and painters of the past all knew that and as time goes on realized how hard it is to get that i feel like that's you know it falls in line with the the older you get the the less you you realize you know about something you know the more you get the, the more you realize oh man i'm you know i only have this much time on this planet to learn everything and there's no way it's going to happen 
the more you learn about it. Um, but I feel like that's, you know, that's where I'm at with my art form. I'm always frustrated with it. So <laughs> like, it's just, the, you're never going to you know, be complacent, be, right? Yeah. No, but what's complacency is boredom. You know, I, it's, it gets me out of bed every day because like, I, I'm great at like taking a lick, man. It's like every day fucks me up. And then I get up the next day and I get to try to, to win, win the day back again. Um, most of the time I don't, but I'm happy with where I wind up, right but, so, um, or at least content enough to try again. A cu couple more questions for you. Our Mark, Mark yeah. Rosicetti, who was having some tech problems that can't be here, he wants to know, do you have a particular, for lack of a better term, canvas that you enjoy painting on? Do you like metal? Do you like a canvas platform or paper? I, do you have a preference? I do um, metal, metal or flat surface. It's similar or similarly prepared, uh, especially for airbrush. Um, to me, the canvas is great for brushwork because it's got to give to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a, there's a bounce to it. Um, the larger the, the you know the tooth of that canvas, the more paint that uh, you know you can leave. So if you've got that nice you know to me anyway, when I would paint traditionally, you know if you've got a nice touch and a, a nice feel for the canvas you know, the, the, the grip of that surface and the way it's prepared. I mean, to me, there's a, there's a give and a take relationship um, there with canvas that's conducive to brushwork. So I've never really found um, a reason to airbrush on canvas. It just doesn't have that relationship for me. Um, but, you know, metal all the way, almost all day. Uh, the, those big panels that you saw that the, the Larry bike was on, um, they're all aluminum composite. Um, oh, yeah. So just a nice, smooth prep surface is what I find works best for me um, because they, you know, really at the they're like little spray, you know, little spray cans is what an airbrush really is. So the smoother the surface, the, the, the better off it works for me. And that's that's just where I am, you know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. Rob Nussbaum would like to know what inspired you to follow this life life path. And do you have any formal training? Um, I went to college, Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida. I got a degree, a Bachelor of Arts degree in art, but they didn't really teach you much traditional formal training. And I think there's a lot of, um, I think a lot of people look at that and they go, oh, you were, you were trained. And it's, you know, I was, I was trained by, you know, the sons and daughters of the abstract expressionists of the 1950s. And I'm talking about the Jackson Pollocks and the Andy Warhols, and they weren't much for tradition. Um, so you know a lot of it is following your own gut and i think to a degree it, it becomes um what you want to do and a lot of it is just putting in the time and the majority of it is self-taught and trial and error and i you know i i feel like you got you, you really have to want it to get good at it um i think some of it you know there's always that like you were born with a, a gift to do something and i really think that 90 percent of it's just working your ass off um, but I'm still inspired to, like today, uh, you know, probably more today than I was even 10 years ago. I'm so jazzed to get up and do what I do and explore every day. That's so awesome. Um, yeah. it is, it's like, I feel like that's the gift right there. Absolutely. It's like, I get, I have this sense of purpose every day. Yeah. Um, you can't be this good without being passionate about what you're doing. You, yeah, I just, don't. Yeah. Well, and, and especially, you can hear it, like, especially it when from you. when you're when you're talking to him, and, and he's still critical and wants to go to the next level. You know, like I've I've seen guys get really good, and you know, like what he was talking about, complacency becomes boredom. You know, and they just they sit on their ass. They get mm -hmm. to a place, and they're like, ah, you know, this is where I can be. You know, and it's that that drive, man. Like I can't imagine. How old are you now? I'm gonna be 45 tomorrow, actually. <sighs> Yeah. Dude, in Forgot. five years, in ten years, like you, you pushing that much, I can't even imagine what your art is going to be like. I don't know. Like I, you know, like I, I hope it's better than it was today. Like, but I feel like that's everybody that's just really into what they do. Like we're only as good as our last, you know, our last job or our last whatever. I mean, I feel like whether you're you're building bikes or writing writing a book or. I mean, I feel like if you're generally jazzed with what, you know, it, it is you, it's, you know, there's no separation of the two. Um, so, I mean, at least it is for me, like I, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's that ingrained in me at this point that I don't know how not to push and pursue because I just, I still see like with what I do, this wide open sea of untapped ideas and things that, and, you know, 
that either aren't being practiced, aren't being looked at, or, or so like, to me, like where I'm at is just one giant experiment and I'm just getting warmed up right now is kind of where I feel I'm at with this whole thing. You know, I've, I've got a lot of failures, uh, you know, under my belt with that kind of mentality, but I have a lot of like really cool, like, uh, insights into my craft and, and different ideas that I've pulled from from a lot of different traditions that just make sense with the way I'm doing things. And intuitively, I still want to put that on a motorcycle tank. That's where I wind up. And I don't even yeah. ask questions as to why in the back of my head, that's where I keep winding up. But like when I wind up, I don't want to put it, I don't want to put it um, on a gallery wall, you know, yeah. like my moniker is fast, fine art. I want that shit on something that's got a function and I don't want it to be, you know, for a rolled, you know, like a, a Rolex rider that needs, you know, to spend five grand on my artwork. I want to do it in a way that, you know, a guy like me can still afford, you know, can still yeah. afford my work. Like I just, that's incredible. there's something to be said when you say grassroots, like that's, that's what I want. I want dirt under my nails. I want, you know, I want that guy who works all fucking day providing for his family who's tinkering all night building his dream bike to be able to like put some rad artwork on it still. I yeah. want to be there for that guy. That's awesome. Like I feel like, but I, yeah, like I feel like that's, you know, I don't know. That's just where I feel like I, I'm supposed to be. So I don't, and that's where I am. Like, that's I, don't, I don't really ask too many questions more than that. Mm. You know, there's uh, quite a few of those guys that are here asking for your website and we've been reposting the website because they, oh, they want to get prints and they want to get work and, you know, I appreciate uh, that. Like, I'll be honest, I would personally, like, I would love to have a piece of your work, but I would never in a million years ask, like, reach out and be like, hey, I want this on my bike. So I'm like, that's that would be ridiculously unobtainium. I would have to be a bazillionaire because it's like, just that <laughs> good. Like, and I'm being honest, I'm so not blowing smoke up your ass. You're just, it blows me away. It really, really does. But I feel like it's like, that's kind of like the, like, I don't even know, like I'm working, like I'm trying to rebuild my website right now. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, using a company right outside of a Atlantic City called Mastermind um, Advertising Agency. And that's one of the big things um, that, that we're working on there. Uh, one of the owners is a rider. So he's, you know, he's, he's actually been a mentor to me over the years too. So that was one of the things he said to me too. He's like, you, you know, in some capacity, you're very affordable. I said, yeah, very much. I mean, he's like, but people don't know that. They see your work and exactly as you just said, Heather, like they don't even bother asking. Right, you know? and, it's uh, just that good. Like but that you don't want to insult be... you. <laughs> no, but like, I like you know, when I see like some of the stuff it, and what people are getting for some of the work that's out there, I'm going, hmm, like I'm kind of, but like, I feel like my process is coming from such a different direction that I'm able to attain a certain quality mm -hmm. in a similar amount of time too and it's it's something that's very thought out and it's something that i've worked very hard at is you know over the years too like especially you know being around a while you hear the same complaints across the board from craftsmen is that's that you know i'm not get you know i'm not getting paid enough for my time and like any artist i think that's really into what they're doing you're always going to give them more than what they're paying like maybe us as artists need to start asking ourselves some questions and that's like more business oriented how can i not you know lose my like you you know lose my integrity or the quality of my work while hitting a price point like what what can i do with out there yeah. you know right. so there's been a lot of that in the last couple of years that i've been looking at as far as my artwork and it's you know not everybody's got thousands and thousands to put into paint after they just put that much into the guts of their bike yeah you know yeah. um so instead of sitting there bitching and complaining that you know, oh. have the opportunity to create art for somebody. Well, then, I mean, then shit. have a, Isn't that what it's uh, about, right? I guess. You yeah. Know, like, no, that's awesome. Nancy, um, we. But I feel like. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you first. Oh uh, no, like I, you know, I was saying this to somebody like last week when we were talking about art and this and that, and I, you know, when you look, I think people forget that that was a commissioned piece of artwork from yeah, from the church. Yeah, I bought it. Like he didn't even want to do that. He, you know. He was paid to do that, so he went and did it, and he was well paid. And, and like, didn't I mean, he like, the, didn't he bitch the whole time too? Like the whole was, time. Yeah, I yeah. think it was seven years he spent on it, <laughs> fired all his help, and just went at it, you know. But you, you know, I think somewhere in contemporary art, people got this idea that 
the artists are the stars and can demand what no like our history is we're blue collar people before the photograph and the better you were at representing what was going around the more work and steady you know steady employment you had like and i feel like people lost touch with that all across the board i mean there's always going to be the the million dollar paintings and and the you know the blue chip art uh, artworks is what what i call it um but we're not there you know we're, we're sitting here you know yep. Tinker in a way, like know know yourself, know what you're you're capable of, but like let's be realistic about what we are too, you know. Um, hey, but, so yeah. we have uh, our our associate producer is watching tonight, and he actually brings up that um, he compares your work to Vermeer's, and he said, "Are are you aware Vermeer, one of the Dutch masters?" Yeah, very much so, and most of my technique um, is based off of that approach, which is a. a traditionally painted grisaille which is called the you know it's, it's your black and white monochromatic buildup um of paint and then the subtle layering or, or glazing, glazing color on top yeah, of it yeah. um and that's ex that's exactly where where the majority of my technique up up to date comes from um when i teach workshops that's exactly what i'm teaching is is basically a vermeer buildup through an airbrush um so yeah i'm very familiar with vermeer the dutch masters wow, that's, um that's far out though dude that's like a, a buddy of mine I, I paint oils with talks about the Miche technique all the time he's trying to get me into it and he's he's showing me that and actually gave me a book on that that whole black and white build up and I, you, I so wish i could do i wish i had the patience for that because in the end it's 100 times faster and so much more depth than everything i wish i could do that Oh, it's the depth. And that's where, yeah, like to me, that's where the depth goes. Like a lot of the stuff that like I'm doing, people don't realize that there's not a single stroke of black in it. There's never a single stroke of white in it. Maybe a little white dab in it, you know, in, you know, in the eye for the, you know, that little glare or the tip of the nose or, yeah. um, but that's just it. That's the thing is, it's just controlling your values. Um, and I work out from that, from like a middle value, like, like right right in the middle like if five is a neutral gray you know one is super light and nine is super dark or vice versa i i, I work in the middle and, and and work my way out very rarely stepping outside my box like i feel like a lot of people are always like trying to get the newest tools and the newest gadgets and the newest thing and this and that um and i just say like master the tools in your sandbox and i don't have many and i'm still trying to master those so yeah like you know it's you know, less is more has always been my motto all, all day long um but you know and i feel like you know you learn that then you know you realize you probably don't need much more than that to begin with well i'm going to um, talk about one other feature of of your artwork that i think is is one of the best strengths of it is your ability to capture expression you know this is this is an artist that does portrait work. One of the hardest things to do, you know, because you can you can be taught to you know divide up the face and get everything in the right position so it doesn't look doesn't look wonky, but to capture somebody's expression is is a whole other art in itself. And I mean, looking over some of the different pieces, the way you do that, man, is just great. Yeah, but, it's great. You can yeah, you cool. can feel it. You can feel it from it. I appreciate that. No, definitely. Um, I think it's just like anything else. You just do it. A, <laughs> you do it for a long enough time. You just you find a way in it. Um, but there's there's certainly a consistency. I and I think I don't overthink things, but I'm never on autopilot either. And you know, there's there's definitely. I guess there's some kind of a zen in that existence in there when you're you're you know you you are in the present you're you're familiar with what you're doing um yeah there's there's that the norman rockwell one at the top yeah, i had to get that um, in i had to show the rest of that to, I, to complete that, that one scene. of my i had fun with that one i still think that was one of my most like fun but you know and again that was me like fanboying over norman rockwell i've done a few norman rockwells for sure at this point do you have um, a favorite piece that you've done mm, like if you had to pick like this is this is this, this what I want to represent me yeah. do you have one in particular I think the one that means the most to me is I did a painting of my son on I, I was working I was painting um, cars at the body uh, the body shop at the time and I would salvage um, 
old like uh, radiators out of the back and I, I found an old Beamer uh, radiator front end wreck. So it was kind of twisted a little bit. Um, and I painted, I, I filled, I've, uh, I filled it in with body filler and I painted a picture of him, a photo I took of him probably within the first five minutes he was born. Um, so it's like almost like a birth photo of him. And I, I called it wrecked at birth, <laughs> just kind of like, it was definitely a metaphor for the, I feel like the day and age that we live right now. Like, you know, like I chose to bring a child, you know, right. help bring a child into this fucked up world that we live in. Um, but it was, it was kind of very realistic looking. And I feel like that was probably for me anyway, the, the, the last real fine art piece that held some heavy, deeper meaning of life kind of, you know, jargon to it that most people would associate with, you know, a, a real like fine art kind of gallery kind of thing. But that to me would, I guess that would sum up in, in a traditional sense, or I guess in a contemporary way though, that you would look at artwork that it, it's got meaning, it's it's decently executed. It it has a, a freshness to it. I, it got into a, it got into a juried show and the, 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 um, the juror was from the Whitney in New York. So I, I was like super jazzed that I actually hung a radiator on on a gallery wall next to like other art and stuff like that. I was pretty, it was laugh. I was laughing at myself a little bit, but I like it. I really enjoy that piece, I guess, for me. But other than I don't get super attached to things, I think it's because I'm constantly kind of trying to move through things. Mm -hmm. So um, everything is kind of ephemeral to me. There's no real permanence. You know, as soon as it's done, I'm, I'm already kind of moving on to the next thing. Um, so I guess that's all I got there. I thought Nancy Weems wants to know if you have a particular subject matter that you prefer painting. Like, do you prefer mm. doing portraits or? I gravitate toward portraits for sure. I would definitely say so. Um, but like, I feel like I can kind of find, um, I kind of get lost in anything I do. Um, everything kind of becomes abstract a, a bit like which is like, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to portraits, but I can find the same mark in, in say somebody's face that I can like, you know, uh, a dead leaf for that matter. Like there's, there's a similarity and a familiarity from one subject to the next for me that, that carries over, you know, like I don't look at it as an eye. I look at it kind of as the, the abstract marks that make up an eye. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, yeah, like you're showing that, like the easy rider scene right there with Jack Nicholson. Um, like to me, the grass around that helmet is way more interesting than that helmet. Like I could get lost in the, the negative spaces <laughs> of that grass more so than I could in that helmet. Like, so I, yeah, I'm very like, like I love Jackson Pollock. I love like Rothko, if you're familiar with him, he's like the guy that paints red and sticks it on the wall that everybody bitches their fifth grader could do. Yeah. Um, but like if you've ever stood in front of one and you realize the scope, the size and how many layers of red are actually on there, it's an actual experience. And I feel like people miss, miss contemporary art that way. Like they judge it from a book or they judge it when they see it on Facebook. But man, when you walk into a gallery and you realize that that piece is, you know, 10 feet high by 30 feet wide, it consumes you yeah. with emotion. And I feel like that's what people miss about contemporary art. But I feel like I find that kind of abstract thinking in realistic subject matter, you know, um, there's not too many, you know, avenues for abstract art. So I feel like I have a very abstract mind, but I find myself pleasant in, in, in painting the, the subject matter that I paint too, because I, you know, I, I find myself in the process. It's not about the end image all the time for me. Um, but obviously when you're, you're being commissioned to do something, which is most of my work, you got to deliver the product, but like, I really get lost in the process and I feel like that's where my love is. And that's why I never really get burnt out because I'm always seeing different new ways of laying paint down and describing form. And, you know, there's just, there's just always so much there to learn. Um, so like faces short answer is where I, is where I find the most joy at the end, but I just don't get tired of whatever you put in front of me. So a couple more questions. Um, this one's from Rob Nussbaum again. He wants to know if you've ever attempted to work outside your typical comfort zone as, you know, abstract or expressionist. Uh, yeah, I actually painted an 18 foot long mural 
abstract out of a moving truck when I was 20 years old in Florida. I was winding wow. up. I had a playbook and I was like nailing this thing with latex house paint. Um, I was doing a lot of abstract work back back in the day, but like everything was like methodical and everything was supposed to go a certain way. And it was the relationship between the planned and, and the actual. Um, and I was painting realistic on the side and I, it was around the time that I stood, picked up an airbrush for the first time. But like I was, I was definitely doing some wacky shit, man. Um, I feel like I was going down an avenue that was not healthy for me at all. Thinking that way, to be quite honest with you, like anything that's conceptual, which is where my mind normally goes, I feel like I, I go down like a, a dark kind of tunnel. It's so there's so much there that your mind almost goes into overload. But I know that like subconsciously, I carry that into my current work. Um, but yeah, I've, I've tried a lot of a lot of different kind of abstract things. I've, I've certainly explored a lot of different avenues. Um, yeah, where I'm at today is kind of where I wound up for sure. Um, but like cognizant of this was the direction that I did choose to go. I didn't just wind up here. I did make a decision that I'm painting on bike tanks. And I like that was literally a, a thought in my mind. And I turned down all other work until this kind of grabbed hold. Well, so, that was a, that was a comment we had a, a while back here that and maybe uh, the idea of a gallery show where it's all helmets and bike tanks, you know, and that's how throughout the gallery, that's how your work's featured. That would be fun. I would love to do something like that. I definitely have the ideas in me. And again, it's like everything in life. It's finding the time to, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. um, I was watching um, a documentary. I, I went on a real like crazy Neil Peart, like like fanboy craze over like I read all his books this past COVID year like all of them um and I started kind of and I was never like a Rush fan but like the more I learned about him after his death the more I'm like this dude's a seeker like he's like yeah. he was a rider he drummed so that he could ride his bike all over the world is yeah. like and I just I really like dug his vibe and the way he led his life um but I watched a, a documentary on Rush probably like six months ago, and they said something that really resonated with me. And it was, I forget what what um, what album they were writing, but they were like, you know, this is only part of our existence. You know, like we have families, we have children, we have, you know, a life outside of the music. And that's something that like I try to, you know, take with me too. I don't, you know, I have my son, I have my daughter, I, you know, I have my girlfriend. The, you know, I don't want to be so consumed by my art that I forget to live a life w with them as part of it too. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like that's an important thing that, you know, that balance right there, it's hard to, to keep, but I feel like, you know, if, if I were to just totally shun all of that, I could probably put together a gallery show much quicker to probably be further along, but further along for what, I guess, if there's no one there to share it with. Right. So. No, right on, man. Right on. Yeah. I don't that's know if really. That made sense. Uh, it, I feel know, like I talk does. too much. No, no I could you, talk to you all night. And, and everybody, oh, everybody right. that's watching, just so you know, like they're they're blown away by the guests that we have on the show tonight. And I feel like you know I don't even deserve any credit because we just made it so that you could be here with us. <laughs> oh no, man! This no, is... no. Listen seriously, like the lesson that you just gave at the end of COVID. This is things people need to pay attention to. Like really the, the things that you do are supposed to be a celebration of life. It's not supposed to be, I think where we all get tied down in it, you know, is, is getting so consumed by the details of it, the pursuit of it, that it takes away from the, the joy of life completely in it, you know, and like, man, you can just see, you can see how much you love, you love life from, the, the expressions in people's faces, the, the, you know, the things that you decide to immortalize in these works are, it's just, it just comes out in all of that. Absolutely. Oh, that was like one of the coolest things anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, no, but like, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you feel like, you know, like you're doing all of this stuff and you're kind of playing to that audience in your head. And the reality is, is that audience is just in your head. And, you know, you feel like, you know, one out of a hundred people might, might, you know, might, might get your trip. And if that's the case, great. And if not, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, it's nice to feel like somebody kind of picks up on some of the stuff you're doing a little bit. Um, so I appreciate that. No, that, that, that means a lot. Wow. Big time. So you touched on this briefly. You said you do workshops. I do. Um, and I'm asking, cause I know Chris would probably. No. 
<laughs> no, you you would probably love to just attend a workshop. To yeah, learn I would. From I would him. like to just watch. Yeah, I really would. I'd like to watch. I'd I'd like to learn about your technique with uh, with the layering and the and the glazing. I would. Oh man, I've got like I've got so many. I used to I used to do a lot of articles for. Here, come here. I used to. Oh no, we got a guest for a second. I used All to. Right. Uh, Hi, buddy. This is Jackson. Say hi, hi, Jackson. Hi. Yeah, he's a little bit, a little bit past your bedtime, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit right I now. I heard he has first day of school tomorrow. <sighs> kind of like first full week back to school, right? Right on. A little bit, yeah. And you should be in bed, but you were up late last night, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, um, but in the, I, um, yeah, I, I used to write for the old Airbrush Action magazine before it went um, defunct years ago, and I had like over a hundred pages of articles kind of like describing my technique. Um, but I feel like my technique's starting to evolve again, uh, like I was saying earlier. Um, but yeah, I was teaching workshops for the Airbrush Art Circus. And I feel like uh, the last year or so, things have kind of, you know, everybody's just starting to open up right now. Yeah. And I feel like um, until like school and everything kind of gets back in place with him, I'm going to stay put until at least June. But it, like the only thing I have penciled in for sure is um, in September, I'm doing um, a three-day workshop with Taylor Schultz at the Paint Huffer headquarters in Arizona. Oh, right nice. Right now. He and I are going to put together a cool uh, a rad we may We may have to crash that. You may have to crash that, oh, for sure. Crash it. That would be so fantastic. Yeah, like, I, I think that's going to be something. Because I, I love everything about that. I love... I am I am a Payne Huffer fifty fifty kid first of all. Yeah, that's that's usually what I use on my stuff for sure. Fifty <laughs> fifty all, all the way. I love Taylor too. So. Yeah, I've become I've become pretty tight with him over the years a little bit. Just I I dig his trip. I dig why he's in it. He just I, yeah. I feel like he just doesn't lose sight of of why he's why he's on this planet and you know, I, you know, a lot of people lose that sight. I, I, yeah. I have faith that most people come back to it, but I feel like there's some solid people that just get it. And he's one of them. And I'm I'm just a huge fan of his work anyway. Right. So that's, you know, like I was saying before, like that's what I think so rad about this industry is like the the collaboration and the figuring out of how to find a synergy and style and, and, and stuff, you know, from builders to painters to, you know, to the leather workers and engravers. It's just, you don't find that, you don't find that anywhere else. It's so, it's so killer. Um, but yeah, normally like my workshop schedule, I was with the Airbrush Art Circus. They were doing two or three around the country. Um, I'm going to try to get with um, Coast Airbrush at some point. Um, I was going to try to do a venue with them this spring. I'm not sure that's going to work out. I might get out there for a day. Um, but we had like some, um, I had some European things lined up last year. And hopefully if things go right, I'll wind up over there in the fall, maybe right before SEMA. But I feel like this will be a transitional year for a lot of people. We'll see where things, you know, things fall. Right on. Um, take it as it is. So Super cool. I like, I personally cannot thank you enough for coming out, taking time out of a Sunday night when I know your kids are going back to school um, to spend with us. Cause oh. I've been dying to talk to you and get to know you better. And I know Chris has, and I'm so happy yeah, we boy. get to share your work with the world. Um, and man, anything that you're doing, like as soon as as soon as you get those wheels rolling again, let us know. We'll be happy to promote all of it. Yeah, oh, dude, I really anything. appreciate that, guys. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I looked at, yeah, when you reached out to me, uh, like last year to do an article, like, I was like, oh my god, like cycle source, just like, <laughs> like really, no, I mean, because I, I consider, you know, to me, you know, like I look at like Chocol and Lisa and what they do with that, I, like to me, y'all are the the soul of of this oh, like that thank I, you. I don't know how else to put it except as plainly as that so you know to kind of get that recognition from you guys i felt like that meant i'm still doing something right you know so Heck like yeah. i really appreciate that um we want so, to share yeah, no, thank you um, uh yeah no much gratitude and appreciation without a doubt so tell everybody where they can follow your incredible work yeah, it's um, all underscores between the words air, oil, and lead. Um, and for those in the know, it's airbrush, oil, paint, lead, pencil. That's where air, oil, and lead came from. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's pretty much the same tag across like social media, Facebook, Instagram. Um, Steve at air, oil, and lead .com if you want to reach me by email. Um, that's pretty much it. Think. Right on, man. So. Well, again, thank you so much cool. for spending your Sunday night with us and 
keep us in the loop because it's it you never cease to amaze me oh man you guys thank you so much i really really appreciate the time and i really appreciate you guys having me on without a doubt um yes, sir. and definitely safe trip back for you guys too oh, i know thank you all right, got man. a little bit of a haul to do but no i really uh, appreciate everything you guys you guys do um and hopefully I can start tuning into some of these podcasts a little bit now that they're going back to school and like <laughs> I might get a little bit of my life back a little bit because normally they'd be going to bed and I'd be hitting the paint like, yeah. and that's where all my time goes. Right. So um, again, yeah, thank you guys so much. Appreciate everything you guys do. Appreciate okay, thank Stephen. You. Thank you very much too, buddy. Take care. Okay, guys. Have a good night. So, hey, man, this is Chris with Cycle Source Magazine. You are listening to Shop Talk, listening and watching through the courtesy of the Dennis Kirk Motorcycle Studio. Dennis Kirk ships today. If you're last minute like I am most of the time, is that a train that outside a train. of the studio? God, we got to park somewhere that's quieter. Right. <laughs> um, listen, man, we're still coming to you live from Daytona because we have, here are the bikes, we haven't left yet. We're not leaving the beach. We're not ready to go back to where nope. it's cold. And uh, we got more to do. So I'm going to throw it over to Heather for a minute. Oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're going to go to the video. We have one video to share with you guys from Daytona. Oh, a little year. recap? Or this, recap? This week, yeah. So this was, the, uh, this was the Warren Lane True Grit Show. Such a good show. And, um, Such a good show. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be bringing you guys a few more of these where we get a lot more stuff involved. But, you know, last minute, here we are. Last minute, Larry. This was uh, this was really one of the first big things we did this week. So hang tight. We're going to take you on a little ride through Daytona 21. We are at Warren Lane's True Grit um, Antique Motorcycle Gathering and Chopper Show. One of my favorite days of the week. I mean, on, I'll be honest, I'm a chopper chick at heart and, uh, and an antique motorcycle girl at heart. So, like, you name it, it's here. I know you don't want to see me. I know you want to see the bike. So I'm going to flip you around, give you a little walkthrough.
He owns Giuseppe's Pizza. Very good, if you are you? anywhere within a hundred mile radius of Daytona Beach, you have to go get his Steel City Wing. Incredible. And he's got a beautiful wife, beautiful family, amazing motorcycle, and an awesome dog that he's going to give me. Yes. Go see him at Giuseppe's. That man was just kissing my wife. <laughs> so, and I, I have to find it in a video B-roll. God hey, damn it. you're the one that accidentally <laughs> grabbed the wrong woman in Sturgis. Oh, well. So. Oh, so, wait a minute. Let me refresh. Accidentally. Air quotes on that. Accidentally. Mm -hmm. So, listen. We're going to have a bunch of stuff uh, on Daytona for the next weeks to come because we got literally a van load of media oh out my of gosh, this. There's so, so much, much stuff. stuff. So much stuff. Um, so, I, I do want to apologize for us being a little bit late with the technical difficulties. We'll be back to our regular scheduled uh, time and efficiency next week. I will try to hit some more news tonight because Heather wants me to get better at this. So real quick, we're going to go through some headlines. Half to, I would be remiss not to mention that Sampy reaches 200 miles per hour in number one qualifier pass. She's amazing. Right? Angel Sampy, amazing. 200 miles an hour. I think I would have. Heed my race suit. She's the latest driver to eclipse the 200 mile an hour club. She claimed the top spot during her second qualifying session. 200 miles. Holy cow. Yep. She's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And I know that's one you want to grow up and be like. Right. I don't want to grow up. Indian motorcycles, apparently, back with the Challenger Challenge. Um, Indian Challenger versus the Harley Davidson Road Glide. Today, Indian Motorcycle announced the return of its Challenger Challenge, a season long demo tour and dealer activation that pits Indian Challenger versus the Harley Davidson Road Glide. Special for the ultimate head to head comparison. Get out and ride one today. That's cool that you can go side by side, ride one, ride the other. Lane splitting will soon be legal for motorcycles in Montana. It's the third state in America to legalize some form of motorcycle lane filtering. I have a question about that. Okay. How much traffic is there really in Montana? <laughs> Just really? wondering. Really? You don't think Just we saying. have? How, we don't have viewers from Montana that you're going to be a ball buster? No, I'm sorry. Just saying. So. Real, can I can I interject in the middle of the news because I don't want to forget this and Walt Curo just brought it up. Go ahead. He obviously um, bid on, bid on and won some auctions at the Flying Pistons breakfast last weekend, um, and Chris was fortunate enough to be a part of that. For those of that you don't know, Fly, Flying Pistons Builder Breakfast that was a mouthful. Um, they work very hard to support our veterans and to get bicycles into schools for children um and this year chris customized a harley davidson iron e for that charity chris and mark excuse me um from flatbrook chops and rod did that along with four other builders and a whole bunch of people in the industry donated some great things to be auctioned off i don't have an exact number but i did talk to jeff nager tonight one of the curators of the flying piston benefit and they said they've raised between 12 and fourteen thousand dollars for this inaugural year back in daytona so for those of that you that did bid and get some auction items thank you from the bottom of our heart they are going to be able to outfit several classrooms with bicycles um, and they're going to get kids off their butts and out in the fresh air so hallelujah um, Rob Nussbaum, Chris's Iron E did, did very that, well. Did very well. We yep. were very happy. Every, everybody's everybody's did oh, great. Oh, they were man. beautiful. I was so yep. impressed. Yep. So one last piece of news, real quick, just because I don't understand this, Harley Davidson to begin selling used motorcycles next month. They're doing um, authorized, like it's a. Oh, I just lost the word. Darn it! Certified, certified use. You know, like when you go to a car lot, it's a certified use. Like they've gone through it, like the 102 point check, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Certified use. Instead That's... of just, oh, we have this trade in, they're actually certifying it as a used vehicle. I wish I had my sound effect. Wah, wah. <laughs> anyway, listen, uh, Mark Purse J said, dude, how cool is that? Such a cool little bike. Glad to be part of it. Wish I could have made it. We wish that you were here, buddy. We wished everybody made it Daytona this year because it was sick. It absolutely was like, it was like somebody jump-started 
everyone's heart in motorcycling again. We all got our heads out of our asses and, and really had a good time together, and I appreciate it. I appreciate being here. On one hand, I was really sad to see it end, but I'm exhausted. <laughs> right on well listen man uh we're gonna cut this one short since we got started a little bit late and we're going over but um remind you again every sunday 9 p.m eastern standard time we go live with shop talk um on tuesdays you can tune in and see coast to coast with chris simmons and mike lichter um wednesdays obviously cannibal Little chronicles <laughs> cannibal chronicles oh oh sorry sorry <laughs> You guys are never going to let him live that down, huh? No. So um, Wednesdays are the Motorcycle Cannibal Chronicles, which um, is a show directly celebrating the greatest old motorcycle race on planet Earth. Tune in, check them all out, all at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, all coming to you live through the courtesy of the Source Media Network, Chopper Town, Cycle Source, and uh, you guys for watching. So. Yeah, and thank you to our... Um our studio host Dennis Kirk we absolutely wouldn't be able to do this every week without them um, and we throw a bunch of crazy stuff at them and they're like <laughs> okay and it's incredible they are so good to work yep. with um, but mostly I want to thank everyone starting with Papa Broyles and everyone that helped us in Daytona Jason because Hallman yeah, Jason and Hallman. Rebecca Cunningham. I thought Jason was gonna was literally just gonna give out I thought Jason was gonna die this week man I think that's what happened last night he was just delirious <laughs> he is if you ever get a chance to spend time with Jason Hallman from Cycle Stuff USA and Garage Built Podcast he is one of the funniest men yeah. ever so one of the uh one of the things that we did that was different this year was we ended off the week at the um, at the Alleyway Custom Show at Adam yes. and Carly Davidson up in um, St. Augustine, and it was one of the last times we get to see the David Mann replica Triumph because that thing is going off, and I believe it's Tuesday they're doing the telethon, right? Tuesday's the telethon. They're actually giving it away next Saturday the 19th at an event in Valrico, Florida, at, I believe at the fly, uh, Forgotten Angels facility. Um, so if you are in or around Valrico, Florida, please attend that. You can get more information at weemsmotorco.com. Putting the link up now. Yep. Look at me. Look how I do that. Look at you. Go, little buddy. You are the <laughs> tiny acorn. Um, so yeah, Weems Motor Co., you have until noon on Sunday the 19th to get your tickets. One chance to win that Triumph is $25. Five is 100 and. I am so honored to say that as of yesterday, they had raised over $70,000 for Forgotten Angels. So kudos oh, to cool. everybody. Kudos to Jared Weems, who's just an incredible human being, and I'm so glad that we know him. Chris, who are you calling? I, I have to do this. Who are you calling? Mark, you're on the air with us. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't close out the show without you, buddy. So if nothing else, this is it. We're, we're gonna we're gonna sign off to everybody and tell you that we'll be back next week with a ton more Daytona coverage. And uh, until then, please stay safe, get out and ride your motorcycle. And we'll be back next week, same chopper time, same chopper channel. Be safe, Felicia. <laughs> I got you in there. Right on, I love it. I've been on through the whole show, so. Thank you, Mark.